We'll be starting up here in a couple of minutes. Letting folks log in. About one more minute, we'll be starting up. Okay. Good morning and uh, welcome to our webinar. And uh, let me just make sure we're recording here before we go any further. Are we recording, Amanda? Yep, we are. Perfect. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So, good morning. My name is David Orr. I'm the director here at the uh, New York State Altap Center of the Cornell Local Roads Program. I want to welcome you to our webinar on traffic safety. This is the second of our second year of foundational or why webinars. Last week we did basics of a good road. Uh, this week we're doing traffic safety. We'll take a break for the uh, Thanksgiving holiday and we'll start back up with budget basics, pavement types and materials and road and street legal issues to end out the year. And then we'll start back up after the holidays at the end of the year. Uh, these why webinars are really foundational things. We're just gonna be covering the basics. And some of them are repeated from last year with some new information. All of them are, will be recorded and available online. Um, so it's something to be thinking about. Now, if you haven't been on one of our webinars before, there are audio settings down in the lower left corner. There's a chat pod. The chat pod is disabled, but we would like you to open that up because that's where we're going to put links, for instance, to our handout for today, which is up on our website in the box folder. And also, we're going to be using some interactive polls, and there's a link to that, and I'll talk more about that here in just a couple of minutes. I may ask you to raise your hand um, just to use that feature to answer a quick question. So as an example, if you would, just raise your hand so I can see how many of you are able to do that. And let's see, we should hopefully get at least 20 of you. Well, about half of you raised your hand. Okay. So, again, a useful thing to be able to help us as we're answering some quick questions. If you do have a question, please put it into the Q&A pod. Um, that question could be everything from I'm having audio problems all the way up to questions about the topic, and we'll make sure we answer those questions. Myself, if it's technical, or Amanda and Jody in the background uh, taking care of some of the logistics issues. And let's thank them for the help that they're providing this morning. Now, if you are looking for professional development hours for continuing education for engineers, this particular webinar, like all of these webinars, is available. Some of them are worth professional development hours, some are not. This one is. It's one PDH in New York State, but only the person who's registered will get credit, but it is credit as a course. Now, if you took it last year, even though we've made some minor modifications, there's really not enough for you to be able to use it twice. So just so you know that if you're getting your 36, we don't know which cycle you're in, you'd have to uh, only be able to count this one once in a one uh, three year period. Now, if you're from another state, you need to check with your LTAP center and we'll find out where you are from here in just a couple of minutes. 
Okay, so we're going to start with a welcome. Um, we're going to be using this interactive poll thing. It's uh, pollev.com slash David or PE. And again, if you open up your chat, there'll be a link there and uh, you don't have to remember and type that all in. So let's just find out where you're from and who you work for and what your titles are. So who do you work for? You work for a town, a county, a city or village, state or federal, tribal, consultants, uh, contractors, and of course we have uh, quite a few of you who are honest, you're working for the weekend. Okay, that's useful, it helps me figure out who's in the room and helps me figure out what we're going to be doing today. I might modify a few things based on that. Okay, if you can't access Poll EV, you can put that information in the Q&A pod and we can uh, just adjust our numbers that way. So I see one person has mentioned there with a pound. Okay. Okay, so about 30% uh, of you with counties, a mix of town, county, county, city, village. Okay, we got a good variety of folks and those honest folks for the weekend. So what's your job? Are you an administrator? Are you a highway superintendent or DFW commissioner? Are you an engineer? Are you in the field? Are you a supervisor? Or are you an elected board member? And if you're none of the above, make sure you put that into the Q&A. So what, I, what that means, because none of the above could mean lots of things. And again, if you can't access things, you can put in the Q&A and have one person who's marked themselves down as an uh, engineer. Okay, so three quarters of you are engineers. Okay, that's good to know. Okay, and then finally, where are you from? Oh, I've got a highway worker, cool. Where are you from? So you can put a little pin on the map where you're from. Um, don't care if you're from New York State or not, but that helps us when we're talking about things, know if we need to highlight the fact of the New York State specific items. Okay, so most of you are from New York, downstate, upstate. We've got one person up in Canada and one person down in Pennsylvania, it looks like. And again, the Q&A, somebody put that they're in the Syracuse area. That's good. To know. Okay, so that helps me. And now we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, these are foundational webinars that we're doing. They're one hour. We can't cover everything that we might be covering in one of our day-long workshops. And this particular webinar pulls a lot of materials from our workshop called Solutions for Safer Roads and Streets. And you're welcome to download that manual from our website. There is a link to it in the handout that we're sending in today uh, that's available again by the chat pod. And, but there's some new information, things that aren't in the workbook right now. We'll probably add them here pretty soon. But there's information that we'll talk about that today. Some of the foundational stuff is starting to change for good reasons, though nothing dramatic, just some things that might help us as we're trying to manage our systems for safety. Now, before we get started, I want to make sure we're all on the same page of crashes versus accidents. This has been true for a while, but it's still a good reminder, and it helps us start to understand the concept of traffic safety. Now, we used to call them accidents. We're calling them crashes now. And here's an easy way to remember. And accidents, we assign blame. We know who had the accident. A crash is just an event. We'll worry about later on what the causes were, but a crash is what we're calling incidents that occur with vehicles or pedestrians or bicycles or buses or trucks, okay? Now, when it comes to crashes on our roads and our streets and our highways and even on our trails, we care about things like the probability of the crash is going to occur. We want to put a little bit more money where it's more likely to have a crash. We want to make sure we think about severity. We really want to focus on the high severity crashes, the ones that can lead to fatalities and serious long-term injury, okay? We label those, by the way, in the statistics, A-level injuries. So you actually may see the acronym KIA, which means someone was killed or there's a very serious injury. That's where we want to put our money because it's the most bang for the buck. And also we care about exposure, and exposure makes a difference, and we'll talk about exposure here in just a minute. So let's go through these three factors. Probability, what are the odds? Okay, you know places where there's more of a risk because people have a hard time with it for some reason. Or in this case, the likelihood people are actually using the security gate. Uh, this is out of Germany. Uh, may not be doing what they think it's doing. So we wanna focus on places with high probability. We wanna worry about severity. You know, if it's a bunch of fender benders, 
we may not like fender benders and minor bumps and property damage, but it may not be justified versus places where there's a high severity. Now, this is the luckiest human being in the world. It's in Nevada where this picture comes from. And as soon as they get out of the hospital, they need to go down to the casino and bet everything because they really had a great day. It looks like a bad day. They came around, they hit the Jersey barrier or the K-rail, depending on what words you like to use, bounced once, flipped 180 degrees and landed by the big culvert there. Looks like a bad day. It could have been much, much worse. So again, places where you've got steep hills, where you've got lots of fixed objects people can hit, places where it's gonna be more severe because of high speed, those are where you wanna focus your money, your efforts, okay? Now, the last one, we call it exposure, but what we really mean is traffic, okay? So I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand if you think the place we need to put our money is on the right. Raise your hand if you think we need to put our, our repair on the right. If you have to choose between these two streets or highways, how many of you would put your money on the right? <clears throat> and by the way, there's no wrong answer here and we're not recording anything in terms of who votes. So some of you are putting that on the right. And from a severity standpoint, you're absolutely correct. Okay, so about a third of you. The difference is the one on the right has a traffic volume during an entire day of maybe 20 to 40, even in the summer when there's lots of traffic along the lake. The one on the left is getting 10,000 plus, close to 20,000 certain times of the year. Both are actually going to be pretty severe if somebody goes off. So we may still want to put our money on the left, even though it's not as severe, because there's just so much more traffic. And that's a balancing act that we're going to all have to think about as we think about traffic safety. So what does traffic safety mean to you? So type in an answer. This is one of those ones you get to type in your answer and you get to put in, try one word, because I think this is going to create a Wordle. I can't remember if this is the Wordle one or the text screen one. I never remember until it starts should put a flag for myself. But what does traffic safety mean to you? Okay, this is one that just gets your whole phrase. You can put a whole phrase in. Safety to the traveling public. Fewer accidents or crashes, okay? Injury free. Yeah, that would be a great goal, okay? We sometimes call that vision zero. We'll talk more about that, okay? Reducing the chances of crashes, okay? That's good. Travel without incident. Everybody gets home safely. That's a good way. Somebody put in the Q&A, safe egress, okay. Protecting from hazards. Clear guidance on where to drive. If people don't crash, we've had a good day. Yeah, okay. Yeah, getting home, I like that. All trips start, if you think about it, at home. They end usually at work or school, but eventually you're gonna go home. So that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to balance those factors to keep people safe. So let's keep that in mind as we think about traffic safety. And traffic safety can be rural, it can be urban. Uh, the key here is to balance these things. And two wrongs, by the way, don't make a right. In this case, no one gets killed. There's a broken arm, but nobody got killed. This is a classic example of one little thing can make a huge difference. Yes, someone was injured, but they walked against the, the light. The light was not, they weren't supposed to be walking then. Somebody went through a red light, had a crash, and again, the person walked away with a broken arm. Could have been much, much worse. So what can we do when we think about traffic safety to reduce the chances of something like this happening? We would like to stop all of this. We'd really like to have none of this. But if you look at traffic statistics, fatalities, these are averages from uh, prior to COVID, uh, 2013 to 2015. And you can see, depending on where you are in the country, there's quite a few ac accidents. <laughs> I even said it there. Crashes that are occurring that are fatal. Okay. And of course, the number of injury crashes is even larger than that. Here in New York State, it was over a thousand. Now, the good news for New York State is prior to COVID, we were getting our numbers down. Right before COVID, that number had dropped to just about 1,000. Uh, COVID didn't help us. Okay. The average across the United States. It's about 34, 35,000. It was slowly creeping down. But in the last two years, the number has jumped and will be over 40,000 fatalities. We're driving faster. We're taking more risk. And while there's less traffic, those higher speeds have led to more fatalities. 
led to more serious crashes. So we need to think a lot about traffic safety as we come out of COVID and we start to get back to, hopefully, back to these better safety numbers we saw before. Now, where do we want to put the bang for the buck, our best bet on our money? Well, let's look at the kinds of fatal crashes that occur. The, these are wedges. That they break it down by factors. Roadway departure, pedestrians and bicycles, and intersections are sort of the three big breakdown areas that we look at. And if you look, roadway departures are really the biggest part of the wedge. By far, in terms of fatalities, over half of all fatals involve someone leaving the roadway. Now, what that means is one of three things. They could be leaving the roadway and going off to the side. They could be leaving the roadway and crossing over the center line, and then you get a head on. And we know those are very severe. Roadway departure really means lane departure in some people's minds. But the key here is keep people in their lane, and you're going to be better off. Now, we started to worry about intersections. That's a pretty big wedge as well. And we got to worry about pedestrians and bicyclists. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that is here in just a couple of minutes. OK, so when I was in school, we learned the three E's and eventually they became the four E's and the five E's and all kinds of E's out there. Well, there are four that we sort of thought about that have become dominant. One of them is education. And we're glad you're here today. That's part of education. We teach people. We also teach the public a little bit. You do your driver's test. That's a form of education. We can do engineering to engineer away some of the things that lead to the more serious crashes. And this is a mailbox. It looks cute, but if you look carefully, you'll actually see it's supported by some angle iron. And if you hit that with a car, you're going to have a really, really bad day. So we want to get rid of things like that. So some engineering can help quite a bit. We'll talk about that. You do need some enforcement. Okay, now if we design our roads well, we can get some self-enforcement, but you're still going to need to have some enforcement. We know that's difficult these days. And then finally, the golden hour, we want to have some emergency response. If we can get people to good medical care within half an hour to an hour, the chances of them being able to walk away with just a minor injury go way up. And chances of them surviving go way up. So emergency response makes a difference. Now, what can we do about that? Well, let's look at the crash factors themselves. This is a pie chart version of a Venn diagram you may have seen, but essentially it breaks down the same way in any case. 93% of the time, there's a human factor involved, okay? Or that could be as someone drunk, someone tired, someone going too fast, someone talking on their cell phone. Human factors are a huge issue when it comes to fatalities. Now, the highway is actually part of the issue about a third of the time, if you think about it. And the vehicle can make a difference as well. So let's talk about some of these things, and let's make sure you understand there's this myth out there that, well, because almost 60% of crashes involve uh, humans alone as the primary cause, there's nothing we can do. Actually, there's quite a bit we can do if we think about how the humans actually behave and deal with that reality. The goal is to not have one mistake lead to essentially a fatality or serious injury. So we'll start with the vehicle itself. Now, obviously, we don't want vehicles like these. These are from the 1960s, the Pinto and the 70s, where the Pinto, you hit the back of the Pinto and it went boom. That's We try to design those things out. Or the Corvair, which Ralph Nader said was unsafe at any speed. So we've gotten rid of most of those problems, though you'll still read about things that happen with new vehicles, and it's something we have to watch carefully. But also, we need to make sure we've maintained our vehicles. Um, there are actually people who think that a bald tire is safer because I get more grip. Well, not really. And as soon as you get some water underneath that, it's going to be very dangerous. And in this particular case, I'm waiting for that tire to go boom. Uh, that's going to be a bad day. You've ever driven a car with a blowout, that's not a good day. So this is why some people think we can do uh, self-driving cars. Uh, this is one from Google. There's all kinds of different people out there doing automated vehicles. Uh, autonomous vehicles are a good future. We're not there yet. And there's still going to always be some human reactions that we have to deal with. A good combination I see in the future, but we're not there yet. So let's talk about the human factors. Now, human factors, you can break them down into expectation, attention, and vision. Don't break those things because perception is reality. 
we have to deal with how people really behave, even if we'd like them to do things differently. Now, this is a cartoon showing people on their phones, but the reality is you've probably seen it, people on their phones. In fact, there's actually a sign, this is out of uh, Brussels, Belgium, where there's a sign that shows people staring at their phone. Now, I'll admit, I'm not sure if it's aimed at the driver or if it's aimed at the uh, people who are walking, but it is a reminder that perception is reality. What people are actually doing is what we have to deal with. Got to do a little education, but we may have to also change some things as well. Don't break people's expectations. So this is a picture, this is up near Lake Placid. Uh, it's an old picture, it's no longer valid anymore, but I took this photograph. In the Q&A, tell me, what is the most critical sign that you see in that sign cluster, which is a little bit too busy. There's so many signs, it's hard to see them all. But what's the most critical sign in that sign cluster? They want to throw in the Q&A pod for me, what they think? Yeah, somebody got it on the first try. That's good, hospital sign. Yeah, that's a pretty important sign. When I took the photograph, that sign was technically legal. It was allowed to have a yellow on brown sign. Now, I have no problem with the idea of having the yellow on brown. We can argue about contrast and all that fun stuff in the Catskills and the Adirondacks. But there are certain signs that are safety related. We just shouldn't break the expectation. A hospital sign is white on blue. And people looking for that expect it to be white on blue anywhere, whether they're in New York State, Montana, Canada, anywhere. That sign is actually a pretty much a universal. Not as universal as a stop sign, but pretty close. Okay. Did you see what it said? Okay. Now your brain says the school. Of course, it's actually the shakul. Um, but don't break people's expectations, but also deal with that. You can actually take advantage of what people expect. And if you stay within their expectations, you'll actually be in pretty good shape. Make sure you understand that people need to pay attention. Okay. So when my computer decides to wake up, there we go. Okay. Are you going to play for me today? Oh, it's not going to play for me today. And it played five minutes ago, or well, 15 minutes ago. Well, people need to pay attention. Uh, this particular video is uh, one about cell phones, and for some reason this morning, it's just not playing for us. But cell phones are a distraction. People lose their attention when they focus on their cell phones. Um, essentially, what happens is they're focused so much on that, they lose the chance for them to see what's around them. They're focused on the wrong thing. And so that's something we have to deal with. Okay. And then finally, vision. Okay, we need to understand people's vision to be doing things really well. This looks like it's moving, doesn't it? Looks like the screen is moving on you. It's perfectly still. It's a still photograph, no video in this case. Our vision changes, and we have to realize that. And as people get older, they have a hard time. They have a hard time driving at night. Twilight is actually one of the worst times. So think about that when you're thinking about the highway. The highway itself can go a long ways to help people, people getting home safely, okay? So let's talk about some of the issues with highway and safety. Now, one of the first things we have is the idea of geometry and traffic control. In other words, how we communicate to the public. We are actually communicating to the public when they see a curve, when they see signs, when they see a super elevated road. All of these things are communicating to them what they need to do. And if it's consistent, the road is actually safer. And speed of by itself isn't necessarily a surrogate for safety, though we'll talk a little bit about that here in just a couple of minutes. So let's look at the geometry and the standards that go along with that. Now, there's tons of standards out there. The most common one everybody talks about is the Ashto Green Book. And it was it's called the Green Book because it used to have a yellow book for rural areas and a blue book for urban areas. And they decided to combine them a few decades ago. And when they did, they decided the book would be green. 
The current manual cover is got green on the back, but it's actually a big picture on the front, but it's still called the green book, okay? And yes, sometimes it's done as one word. And the New York State has something called the Highway Design Manual, which pretty much follows the AASHTO green book with a few New York specific things like limiting the amount of side slope and a corner just because of snow and ice control, which makes perfect sense, okay? Now, AASHTO did come out with some new standards for low volume roads. Originally, it was for 400 vehicles a day. Now it's for up to 2,000 vehicles a day. It's a really a pretty good start for geometric standards. You're probably still going to need to have some other specifics like the highway design manual or your own local items that you add because it's a relatively thin volume that's really focused on the fact that for low volume roads, the level of risk that we're going to have, the exposure, the traffic volumes are such that we can get away with a little bit narrower, a little bit sharper corners, but we still need to be thinking about consistency and not breaking people's expectations. Now, you can develop your own standards, but we recommend use ones that are developed by others. So A, if it changes, it changes automatically, but also B, it's been checked and vetted by those who monitor these systems and make sure reliability-wise, you're in better shape, okay? So hopefully you've adopted some standards. All of these standards usually have within them some functional items that we think about. So we have the principal arterials, the main roads, those typically are wider, higher speeds, okay? More traffic volume that we have to deal with. We can get minor arterials, like going through the center of town that's not the main one, but the secondary major roads, okay? Minor arterials. The collectors here in New York, that's a lot of county system outside of cities and villages, but collecting the traffic from the local road system. And again, you have this idea of very low volume roads of under 400 vehicles a day. Now, in terms of what this means, we talked about this last week, the basics of a good road. And the reason that we're doing these functional classifications is, well, the volume of traffic is mostly on the principal arterial, okay? Depending on where you are in the country, in your particular area, it'll vary some, of course, but almost two thirds of the traffic takes the principal arterial system nationwide. And it's only five to 10%. So the national highway system is there because that is of the principal arterial. That's where we're gonna put our money, but it also tends to be wider roads because we've got higher speeds. Now, if you add in the other arterials, plus the minor arterial street systems, now you're getting upwards of almost 80% of the traffic volume. And you're still only at maybe 25% of the total mileage. That makes perfect sense that that's where we're gonna focus our efforts because that's where most of the volume occurs. The local road system is two thirds to three quarters of the mileage, but it only carries 10 to 30%, but it's really important 10 to 30%. It's the beginning of our trips. It's the end of our trips. It's the road to the store. It's the road to the house. They have to work together and they have to be consistent, which means intersections, especially intersections between the local and the collector system or the collector and the arterial system have to be able to meet all the various traffic that uses it. And we need to definitely think about all the traffic, especially in urban areas where you've got bicycles and pedestrians and buses and trucks. Who's using the roadway? How do you make sure they all work together? Do we have good horizontal and vertical alignment? Okay. And again, think about human factors. Don't break people's expectations. People expect when they see a series of signs, there's a certain sharpness to the corner. Okay. People expect that that roadway might get a little bit wider as you go around the corner, that there's going to be a super elevation. As you come up over a hill, you're not going to have suddenly a big object in the middle of the road. You have enough distance to stop. And one of the most critical factors we deal with is that safe stopping distance, okay? Now, the concept here is really in a car, fairly low down, three and a half feet, is your eye, and you're driving down the roadway, and you want to be able to stop before you hit something that could re lead to a fatal or a serious crash. So something two foot, like a bumper of another car, a big boulder or log, you want to be able to see that. So that's why we have these criterion for stopping distances, okay? Now, what I've talked about so far in our first half hour is the concepts and the basics and the fundamentals and the current standards. But 
This is a phrase by a, a former associate director named Tony Rosenbaum. She had it on her door, and I like the phrase. And it says, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. Okay? Now, what I'm trying to say is things are starting to change. We're trying to say, how do we reduce the crash rate? Not just from 40 back down to the 30s, where we'd like to be, but down towards zero. We'd really like to be at zero. That's really the right number that we should be targeting. We know it's going to be difficult, and I won't even argue that it might not be possible. But how do we get towards there? Now, remember, I mentioned the idea of the four E's, and that's where we all started, and it's a pretty good idea. But the problem with the four E's is it's a series of silos. We do education. We do engineering. We do enforcement. We worry about the golden hour and emergency response, but we do it in silos. So let's think a little bit outside the box and try to come up with ways to improve safety for everybody. One of the things you can think about is standards are important and I'm a big fan of adopting standards, but don't get hung up on, oh my goodness, if I don't meet the standard, we're in big trouble. One of the dangers of standards is we think that suddenly because we meet the standard, somehow the risk goes down, magically drops to almost nothing because we've met the standard. When the reality is something we call substantive safety, as you improve something, you decrease the risk. The standards are set up so that we have decreased most of the risk if we meet the standard, but it's not a sudden drop off. It's really a big curve. So if you have a standard that says you're supposed to be a 12 foot lane and you can only get 11 feet 10 inches, well, 11 feet 10 inches is better than say 10 feet. Uh, 11 feet is better than 10. So make incremental improvements. Look at nominal safety can make a big difference. Another thing, the Federal Highway Administration put this out a couple of years ago, and now it's starting to grow as we're coming out of COVID. The timing is actually pretty good. It's something called the safe systems approach, okay? And the idea is rather than having a series of silos, we're gonna really do this as a holistic look. So we're gonna look at safe road users. We're gonna look at safe vehicles, safe speeds, safe roads, and the emergency response, the post-crash. Care. Now, in our one hour, we can't get into a lot of things, but let's talk about some of the outcomes that have come about due to safe systems. One of them is we really want to focus, especially in urban areas, but even in rural areas where people are walking and biking along the roadway, at trying to reduce the chances of someone being hit. Okay? That's a really risky thing. Pedestrians being hit can lead to some serious issues. At 23 miles an hour, and yeah, that's actually was done in metric, so it's just rounded. 23 miles an hour, about 10% of fatalities of the people who are hit are killed. Okay, so pedestrians who were struck at about 23 miles an hour, pretty good chance of surviving and walking away, but still not zero, 10%. By the way, about 22% a quarter have a serious injury. So that's still about a third. But if you jump that speed just to 42 miles an hour, which isn't really unreal. You see people do that even when it's a 30 mile an hour zone. Now your chances of being killed jump to almost 50%. And that's for the average pedestrian. Vulnerable people who are elderly or really young, the percentages are even higher. And if you start looking at it, you're winding up with only maybe 12, 13% who don't walk away with some serious injury or fatality. And by the time you get up to just over the state speed limit of 55 miles an hour, 90% of pedestrians are killed, and almost all the rest are seriously injured, okay? Which is part of the reason, by the way, on the interstates, we don't want pedestrians and bicycles. Non-motorized users are not allowed because when the crash occurs, it's really, really serious. So we need to focus on ways we can improve safety. So let's look at those five issues. For the safe road users, we need to educate. We still need that education piece, but we need to educate them about safe vehicles and safe speeds and their own activities, okay? We have to think about safe roads and doing some engineering, and there's a lot more to it than just looking at the standards. We need to be thinking about expectations and human factors. In terms of safe speeds, it can help to have enforcement, but there's more to it than just enforcement. It actually goes back to that engineering side. There's actually some safe roads issues 
they can actually manage speeds if it's done properly. You, of course, still have emergency response, and you still, of course, have safe vehicles. But the concept is we want redundancy. We don't want one mistake to lead to a fatality or a serious crash. So maybe somebody is texting. Maybe they're in a vehicle that's a little bit iffy on the brakes, and they're going a little bit too fast. But if the road doesn't break their expectations, maybe we don't get that crash, that we didn't have that extra hole in the Swiss cheese, OK? The concept is, is we try to make sure we look at everything and think about how to reduce the chances of a serious crash. And if we go back and look at our chart where it says crash factors, we can actually do a lot with human factors by thinking about how people behave and how people work, okay? So what do you think as a road manager or as an engineer, what could you do about human factors? What kinds of things can you think about that might actually improve safety that aren't related necessarily to the standards, though they can be? But what can you do about human factors? Let's see. You could put up flashing lights, of warning people of especially a dangerous intersection. I'll disagree with you. There's actually quite a bit we can do with human factors. One of the problems we've had is we've done a lot of human factors trainings, but we haven't really done as good a job, I think, in explaining what the human factors are. More signs, possibly, but sign pollution can actually be a problem too. So good signage can be very effective. Larger signs, improving the signage that we do have and using it effectively, making roads safer by improving the visibility, clear delineation. Yeah, there's some really some good things that we can do out there. And consistency, not breaking expectations makes a big difference. And we are gonna have to continue to do some education. Um, the challenge there, of course, is getting people to listen and to actually change some of their habits. Habits are very, very hard to change. Pavement grooves, rumble strips, mumble strips. Yep. Making roads more intuitive. Thinking about it. Think about the times you're driving when the road does break your expectations. Okay. Removing distractions. That's a good one. Yeah. So there's all kinds of things that we can do. So what I want to do. We could spend a whole day on this. And as I said, we have a whole day course where we talk about all of these issues. But I want to go through a few ideas that are some low hanging fruit that we should all be thinking about that help us with this human factors issue and their good engineering practices as well. OK, so we could talk about rail. We won't do that particular one today, but obviously rail is an issue. But let's go back and start with safe stopping distance. Now, this is what we've used for decades, the concept of the state safe stopping distance. We've changed the heights of the eye and the object over time, but that concept has been around for a long, long time. Well, the latest version of the Green Book and the concepts that we're thinking about now is, you know, in an urban area and even in a rural area, the stopping site distance assumes the driver is paying attention, they're not distracted by anything else, and they immediately put their foot on the brake. And we assume it takes about two and a half seconds from the time they realize something has happened before they put their foot on the brake, okay? Now, a majority of people are actually a little faster than that, but a lot of folks aren't. So we assume two and a half seconds. But in an urban area where you've got all the lights and people are looking for this and they're looking for that, they're not quite sure where to go, it could take longer. Even in a rural area, it's dark, it's at night, it's gonna take a little bit longer. So what we've started realizing is, Maybe what we really need to do is increase that time and do something called a decision site distance, not just stopping, not just stopping the vehicle, but decision site distance. And so for an urban area, that would increase your time for five seconds, okay? Total of four or five seconds. We're not talking about cell phone use where people add five seconds to everything. No, no, no. People need to put that cell phone down. But the concept is a pretty good one. So as we start thinking about upgrading our roadways, think about maybe a little bit longer sight distance than you might expect, especially when there's a lot of distraction. As you're coming into a village from a rural area, as you're in the middle of an urban area with a weird intersection, increasing that. Think about the value of lines. We don't necessarily use lines enough. There are some new standards for how bright lines need to be, but lines make a big difference and they really do help. Okay, so here's an example. Just adding a center line makes a big difference. 
Heck, if you add an edge line, it makes it even easier to see. Though again, you do need to maintain it. And a line that's faded at night could actually decrease safety because now people can't see it. And yet there's an expectation they can. So any of these things I'm talking about, we have to be able to maintain them to some extent. The other thing is we need to think about looking at our whole system. We've done a pretty good job of getting rid of the safety cluster areas, the places where you don't do something, you're going to have a safety issue. So this is something I would keep in mind, the idea of systemic safety. Here's a map I created a few years back. It's showing all of the places with fatal crashes in the southern tier of New York State over the period of 2012 to 2014. Now, I'm going to show you the crashes. The little dots will show up. They're there, but you can't see them until I make them bigger. So let me do it again. Okay. And we'll do this one more time so you can see them. Can you see places that we need to be putting our money because there's a cluster of crashes that are fatal? Can you see any clusters in this right here? In the Q&A, see if somebody thinks there's a place they can point at. At this scale, somebody might be, maybe along the interstate, there might be a few, yeah. But if you actually look at the scale of these dots, even the ones that look like they're on top of each other, like there's a couple up in the Ithaca area. I'll uh, get my little pin out here and see if it's gonna behave this morning. Of course, it's got a color I don't like, so I'm gonna change my pin color. These two dots around the city of Ithaca, they're uh, approximately half a mile apart. So the reality is they're very, very different locations. And what we're finding is, is we've done a pretty good job of getting rid of the clusters. We need to be thinking about the things that lead to these fatal crashes, the sharp corners, the long straightaways with a sharp corner, the downhill grades, the places where maybe they're road isn't quite wide enough. There's an inconsistency. We need to be systemic about things. So focus your efforts on the places that are most likely to be a crash, realizing that crashes are random. And so you don't wait till the crash occurs. You're proactive, looking for the kinds of commonalities, things that we can deal with. And again, I mentioned earlier that roadway departures were our number one thing, almost half of all fatalities. Well, if we look at roadway departure fatal crashes, we've got really three big groups. We've got fixed objects, which is quite a bit, not quite half, but pretty close. Overturning, that means somebody essentially went off the roadway and they rolled and that led to a fatality. And by the way, I hate to say it, but a lot of that is the fact they're not wearing their seatbelt. One of the worst things you can do is not wear a seatbelt in a rolling car, okay? And then of course, opposing. Now, in the case of opposing, we can think about things like rumble strips down the center line or maybe a little bit wider lane so we don't get as much of that. And of course, the interstate, we separate them. But let's focus on that big one there, okay? And then there's some other odd issues that just you can't quite classify them, so we'll take them out, okay? But if we look at this from a harmful event standpoint, okay, we really can see that we got to focus ourselves on fixed objects and we got to focus ourselves on overturning and on opposing, okay? So let's go and think about this a little bit. If we look at the fixed object crashes, we can actually break that down. Again, it was 41% total. Look at the big item here, it's trees. 45% of our fixed object fatalities is when somebody hit a tree. Now, it could be a sign, it could be a pole, it could be other objects. I'm not going to say we shouldn't be focused on them too. But look at your trees. And again, consistency matters. And why are trees so dangerous? Well, here's some testing that was done. These are aerial views. They were done at uh, metric speeds, but I rounded them to the closest US customary. So 30, 43, and 55 miles an hour. Okay? So at 30 miles an hour, you hit a tree, it's got a little bit of ductility to it. This is simulated, but they did some real trees just to confirm this. 30 miles an hour, mostly serious. 
But now you're starting to get into the vehicle at 55 miles an hour. If you hit a big tree, it's probably a fatality. Okay, the chances of walking away are pretty much zero. Okay, trees just have that really good combination where they're really dangerous when they get struck. Anything above about four inches is going to be very, very serious. Okay, so you get trees, you want to think about getting rid of them. And in terms of the kinds of crashes, well, they occur in rural areas, but they also occur in urban areas. You'd be surprised. There's actually quite a few fatalities. Yeah, two thirds are in rural areas, but that means one third are in urban areas in terms of tree fatal crashes. Passenger cars, as you'd expect, about two thirds. But that also means that there's trucks, people on a motorcycle. You'd be surprised how many different times people can hit a tree. Posted speed, you might think makes a big difference. It turns out only about half the time a posted speed of 55 miles an hour is what leads to the fatality. Even at relatively low speeds, hitting a tree is not a good thing, okay? Curves, that eh, makes sense. Curves are a risk, okay? And then of course, the urban areas. Urban areas is still a surprisingly dangerous place if the trees are in the wrong location. So what can we do about tree safety? Got any ideas on what we can do about tree safety? Any thoughts? What can we do? We could put up barriers, yeah, that's a possibility. But remember, rail of itself is dangerous. You could remove the trees. You could keep the clear zone free, okay? You could put reflectors up, okay? We could talk about rail systems, and we actually have one of our webinars in this series is on rail. I think that was last year, so we have to look at the recording, okay? Yeah, the thing about tree safety more than anything else is to be consistent with them. Turns out that's actually a really important factor. We can't get trees out completely where people won't hit them. Uh, almost impossible. People will get off the road quite a big distance, but a consistent distance makes a huge difference in terms of safety. So you all mentioned that the idea of the clear zone is really pretty important. And if you have a clear zone, make sure that it's free of anything that's a fixed object, okay? Whether it's a tree or a utility pole. So if you're defining what the clear zone is, in this case, you can mark with your little pin. You can mark on here, put me a little dot or pin where you think the edge of the clear zone is. Where is the edge of the clear zone in this photograph? Where's the edge of the clear zone? People are thinking. Where's the edge of the clear zone? About eight feet off, okay. By the way, we typically define the clear zone from the edge of the traveled way. So it'd actually be from the white line out. Okay, I'm parked over on the shoulder. But nobody wants to take that risk. Ah, pole EV may not be working. That's too bad, okay? Because it really is pretty interesting what people think the clear zone is. Let me just see something here. I can make sure Poly V is working myself real fast. Because the clear zone is not what people think it is. It's not what you've defined as your right of way. Right of way is not the clear zone. A local agency, a board can actually set a clear zone policy. It takes time to get there, but you can set a policy for what clear zone is. Let's see here. Yeah, I put a dot. Let's see if it's not showing up. That's bizarre. Let's go backwards one and see if it shows up now. Well, that's too bad. <laughs> See that utility pole? That utility pole is sitting in the ditch. If, even if you had a policy that you didn't want anything in the clear zone, if you let a utility pole inside that, that's a fixed object. If you let a tree grow up inside that, that's a fixed object. So even though you've got a really wide zone, most of the roadway, you put a fixed object right where people can strike it. And by the way, in a ditch line is one of the worst places to have anything because if people do go in and off the road, they tend to then run down the ditch line and they'll run right into that utility pole. So I'm gonna show you a clear zone. I'm gonna show you a roadway. Make a decision. Do you wanna go left or do you wanna go right? So if you wanna go right, 
raise your hand. If you want to go right, raise your hand. If you don't want to go, if you want to go left, leave your hand down. And if you didn't vote, well, I'm going to make you go left anyway. So you're going to go right or you're going to go left. And by the way, I should have only given you two and a half seconds to respond, or actually three and a half, because we're in a rural area and doing decision site distance. Okay, so about uh, seven or eight of you went to the right. The rest of you are going to the left because your vehicle's pulling you over to the left. No traffic, so you're not to worry about runoff. But on the other hand, you might be having a bad day because while it looks okay on the left, it's not. See those trees? <laughs> uh, Tree consistency really does matter, but once you decide to take the tree out, take the tree out all the way down. Anything above about four inches can lead to a issue, okay? So this is something that we have to think about. Cut the tree down, get it flush. You could leave it. It's not gonna hurt short term to leave it. You could grind it flat. You could remove it, but the key is think about a smooth clears on a consistent one. And here, you do have some additional trees down the roadway a little bit that are have, having fun, okay. Well, we're gonna move on because my computer decided it was gonna move on. I don't love technology. Make your signs break away. Spend a little bit of extra. It's only a, literally a few pennies, but the difference between a breakaway sign and one like this that isn't, is a huge difference in terms of walking away. Now, you could spend a lot of money on these expensive slip base tests, okay? For the interstate, absolutely worthwhile to do that. And yeah, we've had this technology for quite a while, but it doesn't have to be huge, expensive things. This particular device that struck is literally a 50 cent device. Now, in a rural area, that'd be fine. Now, in an urban one, you may want one of the ones that causes the sign to flop down, which is now you're talking in the 10 to $15 range, but it's cheap insurance versus the initial strike. Make sure anything that is near your roadway is breakaway, that people aren't hitting fixed topics. Think about repairing your edge drop offs and you're widening your curves. We all have seen this, you're going around the corner and we didn't widen the roadway out, even though we're supposed to according to the standards, people cut the corner or their trailer comes around the corner and they've got an edge drop off. Very, very dangerous because if someone goes off that, and they try to come back on the road, they can lose control. There's something called a safety edge, which should be in everybody's toolkit. As you pave a road, put a safety edge on it. And the nice thing is, by the way, when you put a safety edge, if you do it right, you can compact it real well. You may want to do a little bit of what's called a Michigan wedge with a little bit of a straight section, very short, just enough to compact your shoulder against it. But an angle like that is much easier to come back up. And actually, the pavement lasts longer, which is pretty cool. Think about improving your rail systems. Make sure your ends are done properly. Make sure you use rails wherever you need them, but make sure you've designed them properly. We could spend, as I say, a whole hour talking about, actually, we could spend two days talking about rail systems. Good rail systems help. Poor rail systems can actually be very dangerous. In this case, the end speared right into the vehicle because it wasn't transitioned properly from the beginning. So think about improving your rail systems. There's a lot more we could talk about, but again, we got one hour together. It's just the fundamental. I want you to be thinking about improving traffic safety and why we do what we do, okay? Now, so we'll end this with a few PDH questions, but also just get you to think. So what's the name of the new approach to uh, things? This one's working, okay. So let's see what we have for a reply. Yeah, very good, safe systems, okay? Now, vision zero is a concept of everybody getting home safe every single day. You may have heard the phrase uh, vision zero, you may have heard it by other terms, okay? Towards zero deaths, things like that. The concept is the same, getting people home, okay? The safe systems approach just steps on that particular idea and says, let's broaden it. Let's look at all the systems, look at everything and try to reduce not just getting people home, but also getting them home safely and actually at the same time improving 
the characteristics of the roadway, improving even the community. The four E's are still there, but Safe Systems uses that as well. So you can almost think of Safe Systems as the four E's, Vision Zero combined together to make something that improves traffic safety in a holistic combined way. So we can do nothing about the 90% of crashes and do most of the human factors. Is that true? False, only true in highway geometry, or false, but needs a multifaceted approach. Let's see what y'all say. I'm hoping you realize there actually is quite a bit we can do with human factors. There really is. I know it's so tempting. Well, I can't do anything about that drunk. I can't do anything about that person who's on their cell phone. There are things we can do to at least eliminate some of that serious crashes. We're going to have to do some education to get that number to zero. It's never going to be quite zero, probably. But if we don't try, then we're never going to get there. And think about your family, thinking about your kids, thinking about your spouses. What approach would you like people to take? But it's going to have to be multifaceted, not just highway geometry. We focused on that over the years. We need to be thinking outside that particular box and looking at all the things with human factors. What's the most deadly fixed object? What causes the most fatalities? Is it guardrail, utility pole, trees, embankments, or none of the above? Yeah, okay, we got that one down. So we focus on trees, but we like trees. And that's just one of those balancing acts. Trees are good for the environment. Trees are actually good for the community. So the thing about trees is try to be consistent with them, get a good clear zone. And if you do remove trees, make sure you make them flush. Okay? So we've had these answers before. What does traffic safety mean? We talked about fewer accidents and traveling safety to the traveling public. Give me a couple more ideas and see what you got. What else could you be? Reducing the chances of crashes, yeah. To be safe, okay. Protecting from hazards. Okay, so I think all these are the, that's the end of the old ones. Clear guidance on where to drive. Yeah, that makes a huge difference. Lines and signs and helping people with safe roads. Okay, getting people home. No crashes, or if you're going to have crashes, they're minor fender benders. Reasonable safe roads for reasonable drivers, protecting the traveling public. Think about traffic safety as a holistic thing that everybody has a role to play, and together we should do a better job and get that number, not from 40 to 30, but even down to 20,000 or even less. That would be the goal we really should all have, okay? Now, that's today's Y webinar on traffic safety. I wanna thank everybody for joining us. We're gonna be uh, taking a break here with uh, Turkey Day coming up, and we'll be starting up in uh, November 29th with budget basics and then the rest of the year with a couple of more, and we'll be doing more in the spring. So if you've enjoyed these, we hope to see you again uh, on the 29th and throughout the rest of the winter. And I apologize, but it looks like the forecast is calling for actual snow. We've been a while without it. One of the best things you can do in snow for traffic safety, give yourself more time, slow down. So be safe, be kind, be well. Thanks very much and have a great day. Bye-bye.